everybody and welcome to our Windows 11 investing in your secure future event here in our beautiful Brisbane. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cara Mills and I'm one of your friendly client executives here at Microsoft Queensland. For the visually impaired, I have fair skin, blonde hair, hazel eyes. I'm wearing a white jacket, a black top, a white skirt and beige shoes. And my pronouns are she and her. I'd also like to, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're standing here today, the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to past elders, present, future and emerging. At Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and organisation on the planet to be doing more. We truly believe that energised, empowered employees are the key to a durable, competitive advantage for every organisation. As part of Microsoft's regular Work Trend Index reporting, we recently surveyed over 20,000 people across 11 countries. We analysed trillions of Microsoft 365, LinkedIn and Glint productivity signals and labour trends. The data collected pointed to three urgent pivots for leaders today. We need to end productivity paranoia. We need to embrace the fact that people come into the office for connection and collaboration and we need to re-recruit everybody on the journey. And there are no doubt that I'm sure all of these elements resonate with all of you here in the room today in many various and different ways. Now, I've been very lucky since I've been working at Microsoft to have always been empowered to work in a hybrid and flexible manner, which definitely gave me and the organisation the ability to ramp up almost overnight as the emerging needs of COVID-19 were upon us and work from home policies were very quickly introduced. However, for many organisations to meet those changing needs, it wasn't easy and we continue today to be faced by ongoing security threats and flexible work requirements as we adapt to our new working cultures. And I'm sure I don't have to remind any of you here in the room that it's been a hell of a transformational journey and all organisations have been pushed to consider new and innovative ways of doing more with less. Therefore, empowering today's digitally connected and distributed workforce really does require the culture and the right amount of technology in order to achieve this. For those challenges, we'll be exploring lots of that detail today. And how can we be sure that we're taking the right measures to protect your devices and data from cyber attacks while still allowing our organisation to work anywhere at any point in time? I hope you have taken the opportunity outside earlier this morning to look at the latest innovations from our device partners, HP, Dell and Lenovo. And you're also going to hear from experts in the field here this morning on how to protect and ensure 
that your workforce are using Windows 11 and hear directly from some of those customers, such as NAB and the Collect Robinson Law Firm, who are going to share their journey and experience on using Windows 11 and what it's been like to transition within their organisation. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all Andy Malakuti, our ANZ Commercial Category Lead, who's going to talk to you about the what and why of Windows 11. Thanks, Andy. Hello everyone, my name is Andy Malakuti. thank you Cara for the introduction. I'm the commercial category lead for Microsoft here in ANZ. Uh, for the visually impaired I have brown eyes, olive skin, I've got a shaved head, I'm wearing a denim shirt, grey pants and my pronouns are he and him. Today I'm very excited to tell everyone here, both in the room and online, about Windows 11 Pro and how it was built very much for secure hybrid work. Now, when we all, or most of us, went home in sort of March 2020 due to the pandemic, two things immediately came to fruition. The first was remote working became a reality for pretty much everyone. We had to. Digital transformation was accelerated. Organizations needed to enable their workers to be able to function while they're working from home. And so that remote work became a reality for pretty much everyone. But secondly, cyber threats increased significantly around the world and very much here in, in Australia and New Zealand. Now let's look at that market landscape in, in a bit more detail around that security aspect. We've done a lot of research at Microsoft through Terra Nova, through our own security signals report. And what we found through some surveys that we did, that in a company of 1,000 employees, around 200 of them would actually click on a phishing link. And of those, about 140 of them would then download malware, potentially compromising security, data, credentials, etc. Now, around 70% of organizations that we surveyed have experienced some, thought, some sort of threat, incident, uh, phishing attack, critical issue in their hybrid workspace. And in Australia, in the last financial year, we saw cybercrime total more than $33 billion, according to the Australian government's ACSC report. So it's an area that's absolutely getting more significant in terms of a threat. Now, the business landscape, we know it's changed. Hybrid works here, and it's definitely going to stay. Um, you know, we've all had to adapt to hybrid work styles, new business models, and as the cyber attacks become increasingly more prolific and sophisticated, security has become a top priority for organizations around the world. With people working in more places, on more devices, we need to deliver both the flexibility that the users need, but also the security to protect the business. Be it across devices, be it across data, be it across identities, applications, and the cloud. Again, some of the research we found, the, the findings we found from our security signals research, 60% of surveyed organizations have employees that work from home at least some of the time. Can I get a show of hands for people in the room? Has everyone got people working remotely? Yep, pretty much everyone, right? So we've all basically adapted to that. Now, three out of four organizations believe that hybrid work actually leaves them a little bit more vulnerable to security attacks. And 70% of surveyed security decision makers are worried about the risk of device theft as a result of hybrid working and remote working. Now, at Microsoft, we are very much committed, dedicated to the security of our customers. Just to give you an indication, we, do, we analyze roughly 43 trillion security signals each day for intelligent threat detection, rapid responses, et cetera. And the results that we get from that are roughly two and a half billion endpoint queries blocked every single day. 921 password attacks are blocked every second. And we wanna to continue to invest in this space. And we've committed to investing at least US $20 billion over the next five years in research and development to make sure that we're continuing to strengthen the protection even further for our customers. Now, key to ensuring maximum protection are modern devices. 
The reality is that older devices may be putting you and your business at risk and that replacing older PCs and aging PCs can significantly improve security. Again, let's look at that, some of the numbers from our security signal study. 86% of security decision makers that we surveyed say that hardware leaves the organization more vulnerable to, to attack. 87% were saying that at least one firmware attack was experienced in the last two years. Now, what's the solution to this? Well, most of the decision makers actually say, roughly 80% of them say that software alone is not enough protection against emerging threats. They believe that modern hardware is the answer for protecting against emerging and future threats. And that includes things like hardware-based protection, like TPM chips. Again, replacing aging PCs with new modern Windows 11 devices can significantly reduce that security risk to the extent that we're reporting a 3.1 times reduction in firmware attacks. And this is what's come out of the tech oil research. Now, upgrading to Windows 11 might actually be easier than you think. You know, we've got data that shows 99% of applications are compatible with Windows 11. We take app compatibility very, very seriously. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in today's presentations. But I wanna talk a little bit about, more about features and benefits. And before that, let me just show you a quick highlights video to, uh, to, to give you guys a bit of a flavor of what I'm talking about. Okay, so <clears throat> basically what we're saying and what you're seeing in that video is Windows 11 Pro is very much the next step in our evolution of the PC. Now, whether you're adapting to hybrid work, you're upgrading your current devices, you're simplifying your deployment, you're improving productivity or ensuring just business readiness overall, it's very much our next step in the evolution of the PC. It's designed for modern devices, it's optimized for security, and it includes tightly integrated hardware and software working together to provide a higher security baseline than Windows 10. The other key thing is it has protection built in and enabled by default. And this is a key difference between Windows 11 and Windows 10. Okay, so we've talked about security built into Windows 11, but what, what do we actually mean? What does that actually entail? So we're talking about things like security out of the box and enabled by default. We're talking about ongoing protection against evolving threats. And we're talking about streamlined modern security management. And obviously underpinning all of the security features are the business ready features that modern hybrid workers demand. So let's drill in on each of these in a bit more detail so I can give you some more context of what we're, we're trying to do here. 
So firstly, security out of the box. The key thing around Windows 11 is the integration around hardware and software working together to provide powerful out of the box protection. We've already seen a reported 3.1 times reduction in firmware attacks on Windows 11 modern devices. And this is enabled with features such as TPM 2.0 silicon assisted technology, built in enabled security to block software and firmware attacks. We're talking about malware blocks at boot up, We're talking about replacing passwords with Windows Hello biometric authentication. We're talking about stolen device protection with BitLocker encryption and data and network protection by hardware based root of trust. Moving on to the next state, we're talking about protection against evolving threats. You know, we're very much focused on ongoing protection against the ever evolving cyber threats that are consistently we're seeing throughout the, the market in the world. We wanna to continue to provide that forefront of protection against those threats with features such as enhanced phishing protection in Microsoft Defender Smart Screen, helping protect credentials. Now, passwordless authentication Windows Hello, not only for the device login, but now extending to applications and websites. The other key thing is auto locking with presence sensing. So a device locks when the user moves away from the device so that it can't be accessed in a public environment such as a cafe, such as a, an airport lounge, etc. And then protection against untrusted sources by opening files and websites in isolated containers using Microsoft Defender Application Guard. And then there's hardware specific features like Secure Cord PC, Microsoft Pluton Silicon, which allows us to update these features using Windows Update, and again, providing that protection against evolving threats. Then we talk about modern security management, and this is where we support streamlined security management across diverse locations and extend security all the way to the cloud, ultimately helping protect devices, data, applications, identities, anywhere. Using features such as providing secure real-time support through the cloud with remote help. Provide Windows Update for business to stay up to date with the evolving threats very easily. And ensuring policy compliance for both on-site and remote workers with Microsoft Intune. The other key point here is around supporting zero touch deployment of new devices, especially for new hires within an organization using Windows Autopilot. And then finally, single sign-on across all applications with Windows Hello when integrated with Azure Active Directory. But again, underpinning all of the security features are the business ready features that our hybrid workers require. These are critical to supporting our hybrid workers, making sure that they've got the right tools to boost their productivity and collaboration. With ama some amazing new and improved features such as snap layouts to maximize screen space and help multitask, make it multitasking much easier. We've got smarter video conferencing, intelligent noise cancellation, background blur. We've got the ability to share files and mute unmute directly from the taskbar. And then a more intuitive interface with a centered taskbar, personalized file explorer, and star menu app folders. The other key thing for us is our Windows 11 journey is constantly evolving. It is a continuous journey so that we're best prepared to deal with evolving threats and also to provide better productivity and collaboration tools for our users. We just released some new features on Windows 11 as part of our 2022 H2 update. And we're talking about things like enhancing our phishing protection with Windows Defender Smart Screen and presence sending, sensing to add to that whole security story. Now, TestBase and AppAssure are enhanced to ease Windows 11 deployment. And we'll actually talk a bit more about those in one of our um, later presentations. We're talking about remote help, organizational messaging to aid secure management for our IT staff. And then also end user features such as the file explorer tabs, the focus tools and the captions to keep employees productive. The captions is a really interesting one. One of, our, one of my colleagues finds the captions really uh, beneficial to use when they're on the train and they're trying to watch a video, but obviously they can't use loud audio. And that's something that they use even though it's not necessarily for an accessibility uh, reason in that particular instance. 
But the key to all of this, all of the features, security, business tools, etc., for Windows 11 is modern devices. You really can only reduce the risk from cyber attacks by replacing aging PCs with modern Windows 11 devices, which are optimized for security and hybrid work. And it's not only the improved security that comes from modern devices. We're talking about other um, benefits such as improved productivity, improved collaboration, a lower total cost of ownership, and customer satisfaction that we've confirmed through our research that uses experience with modern devices. And modern hardware has really improved in many ways over the last few years, not just in terms of speed and battery performance, but we're talking about things like better connectivity, with faster Wi-Fi, we're talking about faster, simpler USB connectivity, we're talking about better Bluetooth connectivity, we're talking about higher quality audiovisual and webcams and um, the ability to connect do different devices at once. And we're also talking about enhanced touch and pen to allow interaction with the device to get stronger and, and more customized to each indiv individual user. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off in a second. You guys know now that Windows 11 Pro was built specifically for secure hybrid work. It's our direct response to the needs of our customers and how they're using their devices in today's hybrid world. Now you'll hear more about Windows 11 security as well as deployment in later sessions today. But I wanna leave you with one key point. I encourage everyone to progress your Windows 11 deployment journey as soon as possible. With less than three years to go to a Windows 10 end of support, now's the time to really start thinking about how you're going to start adapting to Windows 11 and reap the benefits both from a security, productivity and collaboration perspective. Now before I hand back to Kara, I'm going to leave you with one last video showcasing some exciting new AI powered Bing updates we announced in Windows 11 recently. Thanks everyone for your time. Thank you, Andy. Um, what great insights were shared there, and doesn't everybody love the new Bing, hey? So for our next session, uh, we're gonna hear from some of our customers who have already commenced their Windows 11 journey. Uh, they're gonna share some of their insights and learnings. They've taken all the hard work out of it for you guys, hey? Um, but before we get to the customer panel, I think we're gonna roll a video on L'Oreal and show them what they've been up to with us over the last few years in this space. L'Oréal wants to be a beauty tech company that will change the future of beauty. We create experiences and services to our consumers, and we want to create the same experience for our employees. At L'Oréal, selecting Windows 11 was a no-brainer. For us, it's the foundation of everything we deliver. It's what connects the tools and creates that seamless connectivity between them. Our users are expecting more every day. In order to satisfy that, we are providing a full set of features thanks to Windows 11, like snap layouts, like the new star menu, the new search features, and of course, the seamless integration with Microsoft Edge. We are focusing always in productivity, collaboration, security, and performance, because today we have users all around the world in different settings. They can be at home, they can be at the office or in a business trip, and we need to deliver a quality experience. 
the transition between uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11 was not disruptive. So it's really easy to use and really easy to discover all the features and to manage them, like the way to get the mic or share your screen very easily. I think it's really a positive impact and a positive way to evolve in the way that we are working with all our collaborators. Three years back, we had one image per country, sometimes one image per zone. Nobody was able to deploy the latest version of Windows in less than one year and a an half. For us, Windows 11 was the enabler of the next step. Windows 11 gives us the opportunity to use the latest version and the more secure version of Windows. And it's really important for us because at L'Oréal, Security is by design. At L'Oréal, we have more than 85,000 users. We knew that we had to deploy worldwide in different conditions. With Windows 11, we were able to do it in only four months. Thanks to Autopilot, thanks to Intune, we can do enrollment out of the office. That is a game changer for us. Windows 11 is having a huge and positive feedback in our employees. We are seeing a high level of adoption. The users are not only taking advantage of the futures, they are embracing it. Good morning, everyone, uh, and good afternoon if you're dialing in from Aotearoa. Uh, my name is Mitch Smith. I am a modern endpoint specialist. What does that mean? It means I'm a Windows seller, basically, is what my job is, is to help people understand Windows 11. Uh, for, from an accessibility perspective, I am Caucasian with orange hair, what's left of it, and I am wearing a blue shirt. Um, my role is a, a role where I get to interact with a lot of our partners, I get to interact with a lot of our customers. Uh, I feel really blessed to be able to do that. I get to see a lot of different people's journeys. Um, one of the cool things about uh, Windows 11 that I've seen is that nearly 100% of the managed customers that Microsoft has in Australia and New Zealand are trying it in some way. They have dipped their toe in the water to some degree. Um, now, Andy before did a little bit of a job. He actually sort of made my job redundant in a way. He sold some of the cool stuff about Windows 11. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, he told my story. He was telling he, uh, you about a, a colleague that catches a train. That was me. Um, I live in Barrel in New South Wales, a country town uh, about an hour and a half out of Sydney, God's country. And um, I was joining a Teams meeting on my way home and my headphones died. I did not want the carriage to hear the content of that meeting, which is why I flicked on the live captions. Again, not a feature I thought I'd ever really use, but one that came in incredibly handy on that particular point in time. The other thing that I, uh, I love technically about Windows 11, or from a feature perspective, a user perspective, is uh, focus assist. So, Maybe it's my redheadedness, I'm not sure, but I have a resting cranky face. Or when I am focused, I look cranky. I give a body language off that says, leave me alone, do not come and disturb me. That's what I've been told. That's feedback I've received from my colleagues. Um, when I'm in the office, that's very, very obvious. People can see that. When I'm at home, nobody can. So I get constant pings. Hey, Mitch, have you got a sec? Can I just bother you for a second? That can disrupt my flow. That can take me out of that focus. Focus Assist in Windows 11 is brilliant in the sense that it's so easy to turn on and off and I can literally block anyone from coming in and virtually tapping me on the shoulder. So there's a bunch of things I would really welcome you to explore with Windows 11 if you haven't already. So like I said, nearly all of our managed customers at Microsoft in Australia and New Zealand have tried Windows 11 in some way, shape or form. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by two fantastic guests who have done more than that. They've moved meaningfully towards uh, Windows 11. Uh, so they're gonna share their stories. They're gonna share the good bits, the bad bits, the bits to watch out for effectively. But before we do all that, let's start with introductions. I'm gonna start with Ron, who's sitting next to me here in the room. Uh, so why don't you tell the lovely people who you hey, are. Hey, Mitch. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name's Ron Dutter. I'm the IT Director at McCullough Robertson Lawyers um, for the visual impaired um, probably a bit more advanced than Mitch in regards to lack of hair, um, olive skin, brown eyes, light shirt, dark pants and brown shoes. Um, I'm Colour Robertson Lawyers, we're about 400 uh, plus uh, staff, um, full service national firm. We're about 97 years old, just nearly 100 years old. Wow. Um, but yeah, 400 staff across uh, Brisbane, 
Sydney, Newcastle, Canberra um, and Melbourne. Um, and I've got lucky to actually have a couple of my uh, team here, uh, 14 IT members uh, in, in our team. Awesome. And joining us from apparently not so sunny Melbourne uh, is Mike. So Mike, uh, if you wouldn't mind doing the honours, mate. No problem at all, Mitch. Um, yeah, it's uh, happy to see you all there in uh, sunny Brisbane, not so near. Um, so I'm Mike Garrett, I'm the uh, Head of Workplace Design and uh, Digital Experience at uh, NAB, and um, I work within the workplace um, tech area. He looks after all the, the wonderful Microsoft um, uh, platforms. Um, I think most people would know now we're uh, about 32,000 colleagues, mainly across Australia. We do have um, a bit of an international presence. We've got some big innovation centres in India and Vietnam. We've got other market trading operations in uh, across Asia, um, Europe and, uh, and the US. And in terms of uh, for those who uh, um, you know, if you can't see me too well uh, this morning, um, I'm Caucasian. I've got, it looks like dark hair with a touch-up picture, which is great, but going grey about a second, and I'm wearing a, uh, a blue shirt. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's stay with you for a minute, if we can, mate. Um, you know, the pandemic obviously changed everything for everybody. Um, were there any uh, specific challenges that you faced during that time? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it was obviously huge for everybody. I think like a lot of people, um, a lot of we had a lot of teams that didn't have or weren't enabled for remote access for various reasons. So being able to ramp up pretty quickly to get all our teams across, you know, across the globe working remotely was a challenge. Getting the apps working was probably um, probably the hardest challenge. Um, a bit of luck and, a, and, a, and a, a quite a lot of um, support from our senior execs and CTOs around uh, modernising our, our desktop experience. Prior to COVID, we'd already got onto the modern management um, and I suppose in a, in a way zero trust model. We were already at, um, had a couple of hundred staff um, uh, using what you might call a modern management approach with a zero trust internet only model. We've got Windows 10 um, up and running and um, being managed uh, predominantly by Intune. Um, so we'd already got onto that journey, um, and I think you know, just as COVID hit, and when we really started thinking this is just another a couple of week thing, we were actually able to get over thirty thousand people working remotely in a matter of weeks um, across, you know, with the help of Microsoft and some of our other partners. But that was probably the the, the, the you know a bit of luck that we would started that journey early. Um, but I think it goes to the fact that you know we were being pushed and our own drive to actually modernise. And I think using a modern management, modern desktop allowed us to really just get onto it and, um, you know, minimise the business impact. Awesome. Thanks, mate. And what about you, Ron? Look, similar to Mike's story, I guess, um, I think it was either good luck or more good management. I think it was actually masterstroke. But, <laughs> um, but look, our, um, our firm was actually all on um, mobile. Um, they were actually all on laptops. In late 2019, we'd actually just moved <clears throat> most of our critical systems and applications to either a co-location data center or cloud apps, so um, including collaboration and telephony. So once we sort of hit 2020 and around March, where we actually went into lockdown, um, our organization from, a, from an IT perspective was pretty much ready. Um, so um, we didn't actually have to do too much apart from feeling calls about Sorry, we can't do too much about your internet access at home, but that's because your three or four other kids at home and are all actually working from home. So I, th I think that was probably the only issues or challenges we actually got. We also saw from telephony and collaboration perspective, we actually went from about 30% um, adoption rate to about 90 plus percent in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a space of what, a few weeks. So. Um, I think overall, I mean, IT, from an IT perspective, there were sort of limited challenges um, because most, most of our stuff had actually already moved um, to cloud-hosted solutions. Awesome. Yeah, we notice it in Barrel when the hamster falls off the internet wheel. It, it's, a, <laughs> yes. it's a real trouble, especially with kids, <laughs> kids streaming all the time. It made it, made it very hard. Um, Ron, any specific elements during that time or, or post that made you think about Windows 11 specifically? Um, yeah, look, we were we actually had an aging laptop fleet. Um, we were looking at, um, you know, obviously uh, re replacing that. Um, there were probably lots of issues around that aging uh, laptop fleet. We've actually had 
um, sort of Windows, we were on Windows 10, lots of performance issues, sort of stability issues. So we also were looking at um, moving to more to Microsoft's uh, 365 um, options as well. So it was actually uh, probably a long play in regards to planning to actually up, update the laptop fleet and then move to um, Windows 11 as well. A strategy around that was really about future-proofing our applications. Um, and so, yeah, Windows 11 was actually certainly in the mix. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and yourself, Mike? Yeah, look, I think uh, um, staying current is one of the core pillars of our tech strategy. And um, we, we've kind of modernized pretty much everything over the last um, couple of years. And similar to Ron on the very early adopters of um, Office 365, getting on that journey. Um, I think we use, as I said, we, we were already kind of on the Win 10 mod management, uh, mod management journey, but what um, I suppose the, we use the opportunity of Windows 11 to kind of take it to the next step. So, um, you know, we have, you know, with the, the, the geographic nature of all our, our business banking and retail sites and, and international, you know, having zero touch deployments, using autopilot, things like that. We've seen essential as, as modernizing our kind of logistics chain as much as our as our as our desktop. So um, yeah, we, we just you know we, we were, it was a fairly seamless um, jump, but um, it's it's allowed us to kind of just take it to the to the next step um, and get away from that old um, you know wipe and load approach to to deployment. And um, and uh, as we know, as we talked about today, staying secure is uh, the number one priority for yeah. um, for our customers and our colleagues. Great, Thank, thanks, Mike. And and then, Mike, um, you know, you had so much effort put into preparation. Can you walk us through what the migration process looked like in 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 terms of planning? How did you go about planning that uh, that journey? Yeah, but, but to be honest, it was fairly light compared to what we've seen in the past. Um, I think there was probably about six months of of, of, of work, um, like predominantly focusing on maintaining the security controls and our compliance. And policy compliance. We used the opportunity again to um, try to um, reduce our reliance on group policies and, and moving more of the workload into Intune. So part of that management, um, I suppose, step change, we've, we've decided to, you know, with co-management, um, move most of our management workload into Intune and just use um, Config Manager for RAP deployments. But um, mm. the planning was, you know, fairly light. We, we, you know, looking back at you know, the move from you know XP to Win7, which was I think seven or eight figure number in terms of application remediation, and then moving from seven to ten, a bit less. We've been able to basically operationalize that that jump um, from um, to Windows 11, where um, our move to Windows 11 and working with the app teams has been pretty seamless. It's it's part of BAU now. It's like mm. a patch or a feature upgrade. Didn't require millions of dollars of project funding. Um, what also probably helped, uh, you know, our planning in our journey, we made the, the decision a couple of years ago to leverage Chromium Edge. Um, we had every browser, uh, browser known to man and different, you know, especially frontline staff are using three or four different browsers for different apps, right? It was killing them. So we made the jump um, and got everybody um, supporting their apps on Chromium Edge, which has made a huge, you know, difference to user experience, but that also helped the the application, the web browser application migration as well. So, uh, yeah, much it's a much easier, and um, you know the the promise of the past have really come to come to roost. It's great. Brilliant. You're best. You're essentially battle hardened. I think uh, some of the scars that you probably still have from XP to seven, seven to ten. Um, you know, it's nothing like that. So, so it's good that you were ready to go. Um, love the little plug there on Edge. Thank you, by the way. That was great. Um, Ron, what about you? How about your planning process? What did that look like? Uh, that was probably took a bit longer. I think it was about 12 months. Um, and we, because we had to actually factor in a lot of business applications that we were moving, um, moving to, sort of, I mentioned Office 365 earlier. We also did throw in Edge, but there were a lot of security implications. We wanted to actually move everyone to an MFA, um, you know, Microsoft multi-factor um, as well. Um, we we had to sort of consider our budgetary requirements so you know trying to actually factor in uh, some of the supply chain issues in regards to how long because you know with covid there's obviously going to be a backlog of of device um you know delivery so we sort of had to factor that in into the planning process we factored security um 
we implemented a lot of business applications or upgrades to our business applications. Um, so yeah, so quite an extensive lot of planning, but I think um, at last count, we actually had 10 different streams within this project. So um, from security to applications, um, to collaboration tools, to um, we just sort of took that opportunity to actually move everything across, you know, as, you know, as well as the hardware, Windows 11 and so on. Uh, but we tried to stagger that. Um, so we sort of applied um, sort of business application updates uh, or upgrades along the way. So by the time we rolled out, the change factor or change management for the business was minimal. I mean, it sort of had to be Windows 11, new devices at the end of it all, but certainly um, spreading out and planning and forecasting all of that, uh, we were able to actually deliver those streams sort of in a, in a staged way, I guess. You don't muck around. Uh, big, big, bold projects. Well done. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned MFA. I, I read just recently that um, a lot of cyber insurance policies now will be void if you do not have multi-factor authentication turned on. So yeah, it's a very underestimated, underrated uh, security feature, definitely. And then did you, uh, in all amongst all those different projects, did you pilot Windows 11 with a subset of employees? How did you go about doing that? Yeah, I guess uh, my guys always use me as the guinea pig. Right. Um, I'm the sort of voice of the business. So if, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't work for me, then it shouldn't actually, it probably won't work for the business. But um, we also went through a sort of a stage where we talked to our, uh, our BD team who were actually prior to us moving to Windows 11 and with the, with the new laptop fleet, um, they were looking at, um, these are sort of um, the desktop, you know, desktop developers um, who are graphics heavy sort of you know, users looking at sort of Apple devices. We sort of you know, collaborated with them to say, hey, we're moving on this journey. Do you guys want to actually be part of our pilot? You know, have some of these new devices, you know, maybe it might work better on, on, on a Windows 11 device uh, with, a new, uh, with a new device. Um, and they haven't actually bought Apple devices. So uh, we've, we've now moved most of the firm across and um, they're happy. So, um, so yeah, so they were part of our pilot, early pilot group, I guess. Um, but certainly we actually have what we call a staging team, which is sort of generally IT to actually test the technology to make sure the technology does work. If it does work, then we move it on to either a business pilot team. Wonderful, that's lovely to hear. Um, Mike, what about yourself? How did you go about um, piloting within your organization? Yeah, no, very similar to Ron, we all got to eat our dog food. Luckily, this was uh, very nice dog food. Um, but um, yeah, well, we generally plugged it back into our kind of mature, you know, pilot patching process that we have already. So, uh, you know, we, we, we rolled it out across our workplace tech and then some of our other tech teams, make sure it's okay. We, you know, make sure that the security and then the user experience is right, uh, a bit like Ron. You know, we, we decided to um, and now link it up with our device refresh as well. I think, um, you know, we know Teams is a little bit hungry at the moment from a memory perspective. So we, we, we lifted the, the spec of our devices and um, went out with a, a clean build um, across that. So um, like anybody, we've got some friendlies that like shiny new toys. We've got execs that want to try it out straight away. People think they're going to get a nice new laptop as well as part of it. So. Um, those are the two ends of the, the change scale, um, but uh, yeah, we, we get out and then um, probably you know hit our front line probably probably last. We get them tested off and, and off they go. Mm, great. Um, uh, this is sounding a little bit too much like an infomercial. So changing gear a little. Um, were there any unexpected challenges, Mike, as you move to eleven? Um, I think from from an application perspective, no. Um, I think that's the that's the big takeout we've had from it. That it's as I said, it's it hasn't been much of a, um, a trouble at all. Um, I think the laptop thing we just wanted to make sure we, we covered ourselves off and future proof. The office said we we refresh about ten thousand devices every year. Um, but uh, I think some of the things that we did in the past have really really helped us. We haven't had many complaints about the. Um, the, uh, the interface change, I think it's simplified a lot. You get a few comments that Ooh, it looks like Mac, so it keeps some of the Mac people happy. But uh, it's look, it, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard to actually, you know, whether it's a said it's a bit of luck, good management, you know, good planning and the, the, the scars. It's, 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 it's been a good positive experience for us. 
Fantastic. Uh, what about you, Ron? Any challenges that you saw? There were a couple. I mean, some technical ones, I guess. Um, you know, the deliber deliber deliberation of sort of how we package applications in SCCM and moving into in Intune, um, which actually required a lot of effort, you know, from, from the IT team um, and partners. Um, but we sorted that out. There were some sort of legacy versions of, of sort of our domain controllers that needed to be updated in order for, you know, Windows Hello and sort of biometric scanning and that sort of you know, stuff to actually work uh, much more seamlessly. Um, but other than that, you know, because we sort of staged out sort of 10 different streams of, of the project, um, the last part was really, okay, well, how do we actually get people used to their new laptops, um, uh, which is certainly a big step up from in their previous, the previous fleet, as well as, you know, how do we get them sort of functional with, um, with Windows 11. Um, so we dedicated a minimum 30 minutes for just uh, device and Windows 11 for just training, um, as well as another additional hour for a new application that we're actually implementing as well. So uh, it was everyone, you have to come to an hour and a half training. Um, we can do that because we're only 400 size. Um, and we've actually got a very dictatorial trainer <laughs> um, <laughs> who said, um, if you don't come to training, you don't get your new laptop and Windows 11. So essentially, everyone has to come. Good has to come. Mm. Thanks very much. Um, now, Ron, you already shared with me before that you are at 100% Windows 11 deployed. It's probably, a bit, uh, as of last night, I think there were about I'd call them five strays <laughs> right. okay. um, that this train is trying to actually um, um, sort of capture them and actually, you know, haul them off to training. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's obviously a few more because there's people on leave of absence and a few other things like that, but um, there's only five active users. So I've been promised by late next week, those five should actually be completed. Perfect. Um, wonderful. Wonderful. What about you, Mike? What's your current Win 11 deployment look like? Um, we're up to about 25% of our fleet now, and it's literally happening on a daily basis, about 7,000 devices. We're also, um, you know, moving some of our virtual fleet now across to that, where we, we're, we're um, piloting the Win 365 as well, which um, is just straight Windows 11 at the moment. But as I said, it's, it's going to probably take another 12 to 18 months if we, we link it to um, device refresh across the board. Great. Are you seeing any challenges, Mike, in managing Windows 10 and Windows 11 side by side? Um, not a huge amount. I mean, the Windows 10 was a, a change to that modern management. You know, we we made the call that Windows 11 wasn't going to be hybrid joins. We, we, you know, we're trying to remove our um, reliance on um, internal domain controllers. So Windows 11 is just purely AD. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, keep an eye on those things and making sure that the applications work, but um, not really. It's, uh, I think you said we, we did all the hard work a couple of years ago with Windows 10. Um, we had the same, I suppose, work that Ron mentioned around um, getting um, domain controllers up, up to spec for Windows Hello and some of all the new features, but we kind of got on that a couple of years ago, really good support from our infrastructure teams. Um, so we'd say Windows 11, even though it's, Sounds a big thing. It hasn't been too hard um, for that, um, you know, to, to manage across the board. Mm. Thanks, Mike. Or Ron, same with you. Um, I guess our rollout period was actually probably across a three-month uh, period. Um, in between that three months, which is the sort of start of this year for, for basically the last three months, um, we actually have um, law graduate intakes, um, and they sort of number anywhere between 15 to 25. Um, so it was... One of these sort of questions where this dilemma we had was, should we give them, to, should we move them early onto the new platform or train them on the old, old platform and then move them sort of a few weeks later? So um, we sort of had to wait for that sort of sweet spot. You know, I think, you know, some actually didn't and, you know, the following week or two weeks later, the others did. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I think that's, that was the only challenge, um, um, you know, certainly with, with, we felt that it was, probably easier for us to move them, all new staff coming in somewhere at the start of the, the project rollout, sort of move them onto the new platform rather than actually subject them to, you know, failing devices and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, that was the only challenge, I guess. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, are you seeing any yield from all that work? Are your employees seeing any benefits? Are you seeing any benefits from that move to 11? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, certainly um, failing laptops, you know, you know, 
not stable sort of operating systems, I guess. Um, we still have the same amount of probably the volume of calls coming into the help desk, but the good thing is it's actually not telling us about their devices actually failed yeah. or um, you know performance and stability issues. Um, but it's actually oh how do I do this again? And you know so uh, it will you know I think from a positive perspective it, that sort of volume of calls will actually drop off as people become more knowledgeable about the platform they're currently on. Fantastic. Uh, what about you, Mike? Any any benefits seen so far from the 25% yeah, of the Yeah, very similar, I think, with a nice new bit of hardware and um, Windows 11 um, and the, you know, lightening the, the kind of load on the machine and policies and Intune and things like that. You know, first thing I noticed was just getting more consistent, better performance across the board. So um, I know where we've, we've rolled out Windows 11 new devices to people in Teams, then you, you, you quickly get Teams messages about five seconds later from there. The guy sitting next to him or the other next to him saying, right, can I have one? So, um, yeah, I think it's just that consistent, stable experience and the, sometimes the corporate overhead of security and policies and that, we're just not seeing that impact um, the machine and the experience as much as, as you know, as we did in, in the past. So, um, no, well worth it. Fantastic. Um, Ron, any features? I mean, you've seen a few today, uh, maybe that are new. Any, anything that you're looking forward to potentially rolling out across your org? Um, certainly the snap has actually been, the snap features in Windows 11 has actually been a big positive. Most of our lawyers work off about five different applications at any one time. So they've already got dual screens, um, five, five applications across two screens just doesn't work. Right. Um, so having that snap feature is actually certainly provided um, lots of benefit to them. Um, from an IT security perspective, look, having Intune and actually having all our, all our mobile devices, whether they're laptop or mobile, mobile phones uh, or iPads for that matter, they're all actually under one sort of visible roof that we can actually now control. So that's certainly a benefit from, from us in a security perspective. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because we had sort of 10 streams to roll out on this project, uh, we haven't been able to take advantage of some of the, the new features of, of Windows 11. The idea behind that was that's obviously stage two. Uh, once we probably have that dust settled now, uh, we'll actually now move on to um, uh, especially the 20, uh, the 22 H2 uh, features coming out as well soon. Mm, awesome. Uh, anything from you, Mike? Anything that you've seen that you can't wait to get your hands on or roll out across your org? I think it's, I think we're just literally just you know, peeling back the onion around the amount of accessibility features um, we've got. So, um, you know, we've, we've got a, a kind of mission statement to be a, an employer choice for accessibility and disability. Um, I think Microsoft have got a great story about that. We've been speaking to some of your, your colleagues who sit on various industry steering committees and, um, and um, panels. And yeah, I think it's a great story around that accessibility features we've got that um, I think we can all we can all leverage as well, right? I think uh, that'd be good. I'm sure there's going to be, um, you know, a, a curious but cautious approach to some of the the AI um, on there as well. So, um, like everyone, just want to make sure um, it's it's uh, talking to the right sources and getting the right answers. But um, yeah, I think accessibility stuff's probably the the biggest and probably most exciting thing we can make a really um, big difference with. Awesome. And and thanks, Mike. And before we let you go, any tips or advice or gotchas for the audience that you might want to just leave them with? Um, just don't be scared. I think um, we got on it. We, um, you know, we've got some very good engineers that just, you know, came out of BAU to, to play around, you know, dev environments to get things up and running. Just, just make sure the security controls in there and just patch, 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 stay current. Don't let the bad guys, you know, don't make it easy for them at the moment. So um, yeah, just get your patches and stay current and um, make it hard for them. Great. Thanks, Mike. And what about you, Ron? Um, make sure you have a good team and actually train that team, give them a bit of time, um, still press them a bit. Um, yeah. Having good, you know, good, good partners um, to actually complement your internal capabilities um, and give yourself a bit of time because you never know there's some sort of gotchas around the corner that just sometimes takes a bit of time to actually just fix those. Um, we originally had a plan to roll out before, uh, before Christmas last year. Um, supply chain issues, a few other sort of technical issues that, sure. that I've mentioned, but it was a case of, well, why, let's, let's move it into the new year. Mm. Great. Thank you both so much for your time. I really hope that the audience got as much as I did out of uh, you sharing your stories. Um, earlier, we heard from L'Oreal uh, as they migrated 85,000 of their users across uh, four months. Um, 
No, they, they really laboured on the security and the end user experience as part of their top of mind. You just heard from NAB and McCulloch Robertson lawyers about their Windows 11 journey. Um, what I'd like to leave you with now is a short video um, from the first customer who holistically adopted Windows 11, Microsoft. Uh, Natalie Dares, Microsoft CVP of Digital Employee Experience, will share insights into what we experienced as an organization as we migrated 195,000 users in five weeks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Wangui McKelvey, General Manager of the Microsoft 365 business here at Microsoft. Today, I'm here with Natalie Dares, Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Digital Employee Experience. Hey, Natalie, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Wangui. I'm really happy to be here to share how we imagine the employee experience at Microsoft uh, to support the hybrid workplace and the critical role that Windows 11 has played in that process. Windows 11 is designed specifically to empower hybrid work while keeping organizations and employees' data, content, and apps secure on any device. Now, Microsoft is an organization with over 275,000 employees and vendors, and that's a massive scale to account for and to adapt to. Natalie, how do you even begin to think about ensuring each employee is not only equipped with the right tools and resources they need, but get the best possible experience from day one? Yeah, in Microsoft uh, Digital Employee Experience, our mission is to power, protect, and transform the employee experience at Microsoft, and then provide the blueprint for our customers and partners to follow. And employees are the backbone of any organization. So whether it's day one or year 20, every employee needs the right experience to be successful in their role. And so when an employee joins Microsoft, they receive a welcome kit and they unbox their PC and Windows is the first thing they interact with. And as you know, first impressions count, as does every impression an employee has of how their organization equips and prepares them to succeed. And Windows 11 makes an amazing first impression. As a technology-driven company, we want our employees to see how we're on the leading edge of innovation, including becoming early adopters of our own products and services. What has Microsoft's approach been to Windows 11? As Customer Zero, we're the first to test drive all of the new products and services at Microsoft, and our learnings from this are critical to ensuring that whatever we put into the market delivers a great experience to customers and partners. And we're excited that moving to Windows 11 helped us achieve our goals for employee satisfaction. Shifting to Windows 11 was actually a breeze and we upgraded 190,000 devices in only five weeks. We also saw low support call volume and positive feedback from employees about features and functionality and not product issues or reliability. I do want to acknowledge that we at Microsoft are really privileged to be part of a technology first company. But even so, there are steps that you can take to ensure a smooth rollout. What can other organizations learn from Microsoft's experience? At Microsoft, we've already moved to cloud-based management, uh, which makes upgrading to Windows 11 really easy to manage. Organizations should also know that Windows 11 is built on the same foundation as Windows 10. And so upgrading is easy, secure, and it's a stable experience that doesn't require investment in new tools or processes. From remote onboarding to virtual meetings, emails, and casual coffee chats, Windows 11 has become the secure platform that's foundational to our hybrid workplace strategy. What are your recommendations, Natalie, for organizations to continue as they learn to adapt to the evolving demands of hybrid work? To have success in the hybrid workplace um, it requires strong alignment between your digital experience, uh, physical spaces, and organizational culture. And without investing equally in all three, your employees won't thrive in the world of hybrid work. Thanks again for joining me today, Natalie. It's been a real pleasure sharing our Windows 11 journey uh, with you today. We're so pleased to be customer zero for Windows, and I'm confident uh, that the hard work the team has done to test and validate the experience at Microsoft is going to pay off for our customers and partners. And even if you're not planning to upgrade soon, rest assured that when you are ready, your employees will benefit from all the great capabilities in Windows 11. Based on our experience, whenever you're ready, Windows 11 is ready for you.
Nothing like hearing from our customers, hey. Um, so thank you so much, Mitch, uh, Mike, and obviously Ron and team down here. Congratulations on your early adopter success. Great to share all those insights and learnings with everybody. Okay, um, so now it's time for us to focus on our Windows uh, 11 specific security and deployment capabilities discussion. So I'd love to invite to the stage uh, two of my wonderful colleagues here in Queensland. Fraser, I think you're gonna kick us off and then we're gonna hand over to Anthony. Thanks, Fraser. Good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Fraser Wilson. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I mainly work with our partners. Um, I've been at Microsoft for about six years now, I'm mainly focused on security solutions. But when I first started, I was doing Windows deployment, helping all our customers move, essentially move from Windows 7 to Windows 10 using our cloud tools and on-premises tools. And today I'm here to talk about a bit of an overview of Windows 11 security and how it can help you protect your organization. The first thing I want to set the scene is for everyone in the audience and everyone online, first and foremost, Microsoft is a security company. Um, we are the biggest security company in the world. If you take about market capitalization, talk about product, talk about features. So it's something that people don't maybe don't understand or maybe a misconception is that we've got a portfolio of about six product families with 50 individual products focused on different security threats. So us making Windows 11 the most secure operating system we have is in our blood. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, every year we release the Digital Defense Report, um, a very excellent piece of resource just to explain what Microsoft's doing when it comes to digital defense around the world. Um, awesome, awesome white papers we have around security is stuff around the Ukrainian war, how Microsoft has helped the Ukrainian government against cyber attacks from other adversarial nations. <clears throat> I guess today's challenges. So, um, lots of challenges with a lot of organizations um, around deploying endpoints, making sure they're secure, re-imaging, managing endpoints, things like this. But fundamentally, zero trust is a foundation for a lot of these sort of methodologies and mindsets. So I guess with Microsoft and Windows 11, <clears throat> we've essentially built zero trust from the core up. Um, so essentially from hardware up to the cloud, we've got a zero trust mindset um, to secure your PC, um, from any type of a threats and adversarial threats we have in a hardware layer to a software layer to a cloud layer. So what does that actually mean? So essentially Windows 11 allows the hardware and software to work together um, from the CPU up to the cloud using a foundation of principles and priorities. So we've incorporated the zero trust principle. So everyone does know zero trust is a framework not owned by Microsoft, but it's an industry framework, but we've adopted that across our products and solutions. Essentially, it has three main principles. Always verify. So making sure your identity is always verified. For example, multi-factor authentication. Using least privilege. So what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna use an on-premises example. If all my users are domain admin, bad, as an example. Um, so making sure you've got the least privilege for your organization for having access to the roles and responsibilities on the IT systems that you need to have. And lastly is the assumed breach mindset. So this is a foundation. So um, the mean time for an adversary in most organization networks, about 90 days. So what does that mean is, you know, there's a good chance that you could be compromised today without realizing it because the main detection time hasn't occurred, but doing reconnaissance, discovering your organization. So you've got to build your IT system, security system with that assume breach mindset. Um, it's essentially what that means. Our priorities in Windows 11, so our foundations is secure by default. So my colleague Andy talked a little about this in his presentation and Mitch with our customers sort of talked about the benefits of this. Hardware-based isolation. So having isolation of the hardware barrier, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Virtualized based security. So using essentially component hubs of the components like bits of kernel, bits of um, processes into virtual buckets to be more secure. Robust application security. So essentially hardening with things like WDAC, application guard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, secure user identity. So using that sort of a verified expressive mindset is having your identity secure. Um, people who don't know, identity is a new security barrier. If your security strategy relies on a firewall, the big moat and a big castle, um, that model's dead. So not the best way of doing security these days is definitely having the identity secure as foundation. Um, 
adversaries log in, they don't break in, they log in with stolen credentials, unfortunately. Then cloud security. So I guess a lot of organizations are moving to the cloud. You wanna make sure that you're secure in the cloud. It's a lot easier to do security in the cloud, but it's a lot easier to not do security crowd if you don't follow the right foundations and mindsets. So what does secure by default mean? So essentially Microsoft's been on security journey since Windows 7, essentially guys. So even though we might get a bit of flack from people around Windows, we've been on security journey since that sort of time frame. So our foundations, we've got things like making sure our supply chains are secure. We've got certificate authorities across all of our processes, drivers, things like this. So an example of that is any, I mean, after Windows 10, any driver that you put into your Windows device is signed by Microsoft, essentially. You can disable that, not obviously by default. Um, so what does that mean? Is you have less risk of having a driver-based threat like you would have back in XP slash Win7 days. Um, our chip layer security. So we've talked about TPM 2.0. So this is one of the main foundational reasons why customers should be moving to Windows 11 and investing in new hardware and kit is essentially for TPM 2.0 and our new Pluton Cyclin chips that we've designed by Microsoft and designed with our partner ecosystem, such as OEMs. Um, going up from the stack, um, we'll talk about our other sort of security benefits that we have. So we've got things like Trusted Boot. So Trusted Boot's been around since Windows 8. Um, what that is, is essentially BitLocker. It's encrypted on the machine, but we'll also measure what a known good boot is for a machine. So what does that mean? It's to help mitigate boot, um, boot kit attacks. So something like a piece of malware embedding itself before Windows boots to redeploy itself. It's protecting against that type of threat. Um, we've got things like device health attestation. So what does that mean? So with Microsoft Intune, um, I can essentially send signals on my device health into Intune to our MDM service and provider to actually report back on compliance. So an example at Microsoft is, all our devices have what's called device-based conditional access. When I go and try to connect to any Microsoft system, so that could be my email, um, I don't know, customer data, et cetera, et cetera, I can't physically do that from my personal device unless it's managed by corporate IT and our security policies are being deployed to it. So that's one of our foundational things around zero trust, it's essentially verifying my device is who it is, it's compliant with security policies like BitLocker, Defender AV, MDE, risk signals, and things like this to essentially say, hey, this device is all good and verified before I can even connect to my work resources. You can also incorporate that into a VPN product for customers who aren't in the cloud. So if I connect to a VPN on-premises using device-based conditional access, I can essentially verify, hey, MFA might be a requirement, but my device has to be secure no viruses, no malware, et cetera, et cetera, before I can actually connect to our on-premises corporate resources. Now, when we go up a little bit our stack, we've got things like BitLocker. So hopefully everyone's been using BitLocker for a long time. That helps us protect our data at rest. So what does that mean? If I lose a device on the train, let's just use as an example, um, if I don't have BitLocker as an adversary, I can get that device, load up with a Linux distro like Kelly, for example, and go and steal your credentials um, stored locally on the disk, right? I can physically do that if I don't have BitLocker on my devices. So that's why BitLocker is important for device at rest scenarios. Um, we've got network-based security. So we've got things like TOS, Wi-Fi security, DNS security, um, the Windows Defender Firewall. So if everyone's environment today, firewall's turned off, bad, turn firewall on, configure Windows firewall, there's a reason for this. Next is around our virus and, you know, sort of virus capabilities and threat protection capabilities. So it has a couple of main components. So we've got Defender AV, um, best in breed AV software with a leader in Gartner and Forrester when it comes to endpoint security. Um, a lot of people don't know this. Um, Defender AV, part of Windows, but you can also add additional licenses with our E5 stack and have Defender for endpoints. So that's our EDR capability. So what that does is essentially um, protect against a post breach scenario and also correlate signals and automation into your Defender AV stack. We go up the stack a little bit more and we've got our application-based security. So that includes things like application guard. Um, application guard is a way of virtualizing things like the office browser, oh sorry, the office um, application or your edge browser into a virtualized bucket. So we talked about um, isolating key processes. So for example, 
I'm browsing the internet, a piece of malware comes down from a drive-by download. If it's virtualized in its own container, it can't get onto the OS and operating system, as an example. Application control for Windows Defender application control. Um, what that does is essentially have a hardened security policy, sort of like AppLocker, but the next generation of AppLocker for anyone using AppLocker today. Um, so I can make a process, make it pretty tight and secure, and it pretty much means nothing unauthorized, like non-signed applications, non-whitelisted hash rules, non-whitelisted file path rules can execute on my machine. And the benefit of it is an admin can't turn it off easily. So unfortunately with AppLocker, if I've got admin access, I know how to turn it off. And unfortunately that means adversaries might know how to turn it off. With WDAC, it's a lot more secure when it comes to those sort of circumstances. Um, user access control, been around for Windows since Windows 7, verifying you know, application streams to do X, Y, and Z. Um, we'll go up the stack a little bit, talking about identity-based solutions. So we talk about Windows, Windows Hello. Um, outside the productivity gains of not having a password, one of the foundation things is passless authentication. So the idea around it is at Microsoft and a lot of our customers, they might use Windows Hello to log onto the local machine, pass this authentication on the actual Office website or the Azure portal. The reason for this is if I can't type in a password, my password can't be fished and use that credential to go on and compromise me. So using a password authentication strategy is foundation to your organization. A question I used to get asked during delivery work is how is Hello for Business more secure because um, it might be a pin-based authentication compared to uh, our 20-digit character password. The main reason is because we're using a TPM chip to essentially do a key pair between the machine itself and the identity provider that could be Active Directory or Azure Active Directory to essentially do a key pair. So when I authenticate to something, the way this process works is I have a packet, I authenticate to my domain controller. Um, it only can be sent from Fraser because I own the private key pair still locally on my device. The public key pair is associated with my user identity in Azure Active Directory or Active Directory. I get a token back, happy days. So what does that mean? Is that that pin doesn't run from device to device. If we need a shared device scenario, that's where we've got security keys for that sort of exact scenario. And then we've got our cloud-based services. So, you know, we've got, for example, OneDrive for Business. Um, you know, I can't put malware on OneDrive for Business. It won't let you. It will stop syncing or tell you, hey, this is malware, detect X, Y, and Z. So I guess a lot of organizations, they might use SMB file shares today. Um, you really should incorporate using the Microsoft Cloud services to help with, you know, accessing files anywhere. Obviously a big plus. Um, not only you rely on legacy VPN systems, invest on on-premises hardware and kit. Um, just paying a flat office fee than using SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business to store your documents. And lots of other benefits outside of Windows 11 specifically, guys. I talked about our foundation with our chip. So... Uh, Microsoft designed and built with our silicon partners like, you know, Intel, AMD, and our OEMs, um, essentially a new sort of way of doing TPM to an extent. The idea around this is to have ongoing up-to-date protection for our silicon chips. Um, block physical based attacks. So, um, you know, you can't go through and have physical access to the device and do some, you know, known tricks you might have used to do back in the day with our new proton chip technology. And it's been, you know, helped and collaborated with our partner ecosystem. And something that's cool is that if anyone has a Microsoft Xbox today, it's the same architecture we designed for Xbox and Azure Thea that we put into our enterprise and consumer products for Windows 11 and our OEM ecosystems. So what am I talking about? So essentially, this is a secure process for cryptographic um, processes. An example back in the day is we had a TPM chip on the board here. Um, it has a bus interface from our CPU talking to our chip interface. So there could be a vulnerability of a physical exploit across that bus to go and steal cryptographic keys, essentially. Um, with the now enabled CPUs, is essentially built in the CPU stack, so that physical access or that physical attack barrier doesn't exist anymore. Um, TPM is foundation for a lot of features I've talked about. So we talked about BitLocker. TPM is used to store BitLock encryption keys. Um, Windows Hello for Business, TPMs use the cryptographic functions for Hello for Business. For anyone who uses certificate authorities or using a certificate to, you know, do Wi-Fi authentication, VPN authentication, or certificate-based authentication, use the TPM chip to help encrypt the certificates, as an example, during a key pair enrollment, and lots of features like that. So one of the foundations in our base is having that physical security secure, 
then layering our controls up the stack. Just don't take our word for it. Um, there's some white papers for our OEM partners talking about this. And we've got some great blog posts internally talking about this sort of steps. A bit of a summary, guys. So I guess we've talked about the principles of zero trust security for Windows 11, the technology stack um, that meets up from essentially our chip to the OS, to the application layer, to our identities, to the cloud upwards, uh, as being foundation to Windows 11. So it gives us the ability to have end-to-end -end encryption across our assets and resources and the ability to detect and block advanced malware threats across our um, assets and resources. And guys, um, just some minimum requirements that you might have. Um, so anyone who doesn't realize, main of the reasons why you need to get new hardware and kit is for this chipset we've talked about and TPM 2.0. Um, so if your kit doesn't have this today, it's time to invest in new hardware to make sure that you're secure from a foundational base and be able to leverage some of the security features I've talked about. And everyone on the call in our webinar series has joined in. Just a call to action is having a view of the Windows 11 security ebook that we have. So it talks about a lot of these features in depth and in detail that you guys can investigate. Um, it goes with links to our Microsoft Learn documentation around this information. Um, and anyone in the audience today, feel free to come and chat to me. Um, I just don't do Windows 11 security. I do all security compliance solutions. So happy to have a chat with anyone in the audience today. And everyone, that's me in my presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Anthony, who's going to talk about more deployment and management aspects of Windows 11. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as you can see from the slide, my name is Anthony Healy. I'm what we call a Cloud Endpoint Technology Specialist. So I join you today from a disability perspective. I'm a Caucasian with salt and pepper hair, um, blue shirt and dark trousers. Um, so what is a Cloud Endpoint Technology Specialist? So I'm based here in Brisbane and what we do is we help organizations that are still what we call dark and help them to go move to cloud. So think about moving from legacy or on-premise device management to modern management with the likes of Intune. We're also here about the modern experiences, so Windows 11 and also Windows 365. Um, if you're an existing um, um, E3, sorry, um, an existing on-premise customer, come and talk to us a bit later and we can help you understand those migration paths. Um, one thing I want to highlight to you today is that through our journey, and actually I was very interested to hear our, um, our, our customers talk this morning, is what they've effectively told you today is what I'm going to cover, you, cover with you right now. So it was really good to hear that that deployment methodologies that we're talking about today um, has actually been proven. Sorry, can I just have my scroll move up now? Um, so one thing that Microsoft has uh, found over the last couple of years is that when the migration moved to Windows 11 um, has been a very slow journey. So if you look back in time, organizations have typically moved from operating system to operating system. So from version seven to eight to 10, and it takes over nearly up to five years. Why is that? So typically what we find is as IT professionals is we've gone and looked at, first of all, what is the, um, um, you know, what is the end service date? Now that service date might be three years away, but then they'll work backwards. Okay, I've now got applications that I need to be, make sure they're compatible. And then they even work back even further again, what are the new features and functions that I want to bring into the organization? So they're actually putting it back to it, backwards. So if we look at the, the journey, um, and before I go any further, I'm probably interested to ask, now that you've listened to the speakers before me, what would be two outcomes that you would like to see or achieve with your, mon with your modernization of your endpoints to Windows 11? Anyone got a take us? Typically, as you probably have heard, is that we want to make sure that our end users and our business remain productive and secure. So they're probably two outcomes that I'll probably want to help people to, uh, to help understand. So Windows 11 it was built for the hybrid work. Uh, it enables our teams to be collaborative, to be productive, but also to be secure. 
Windows 11 also allows us to have that modern management as well as our modern security capabilities. So as the title says up the very top, you've got the, sorry, click, yep. Um, as, it, as it says up the very top, you've got identity, access, and device. Do I have to even push that? Sorry, can't see it. It's in the build process. So as it says up the very top, you've got identities, access, device, and app management. And as this phrase has already mentioned to you, zero trust, that's the basis or the foundations um, to zero trust. And then zero trust is all about that device and the identity being proven and the integrity being validated before you give them access to their, their, um, the right services. So as Fraser has already said, you know, Windows 11 has, been, has built the new security foundations. You've now got new requirements for hardware and in software. And as we move from that to chip to cloud, so my scroll's not quite working first. Okay, so at first glance, the modernizing endpoint is a lot, has a lot to unpack. I, grant, I give you that, and I don't want to turn this into a five-day workshop. So what we'll do is we'll touch on a couple of these features and functions, and then we'll go into in some of those in more detail. So let's start at the very first. The journey begins with identity. So moving to a good cloud identity allows us to have additional levels of security and operations that we can't typically get from Active Directory. So you can now get into things like, as uh, Fraser said, and the speakers before us, that you start using things like conditional access. And conditional access is probably one of the critical parts, paths to ensuring that our devices and, and services are made uh, secure. What's the next one? So cloud files and services. What has that got to do with device provisioning? So it is, I guess, a feature they have features built into that that help us with the modernization of our endpoints. So where you've got the likes of um, OneDrive, for business, OneDrive, for example, that's probably a key element to helping our end user experiences adopt the new operating system. So OneDrive known folder moves is, is probably one of those key ones as well, as well as the um, file on, files on demand. We'll move over to modern devices. So modern devices is probably the key foundation, the key base to allow us to bring that security and that uh, management to the, to the bear. Now that's also from our OEM providers. Then you look at device management. Device management, and, and it was interesting to hear from NAB and from Ron um, talk, so from Mike and Ron talk this morning around autopilot. So modern device management actually starts you know, from that procurement stage. So when you've gone and procure that device, particularly the new ones, is you register that with, the, register that with autopilot. And then you've got zero touch provisioning. And then you're now allowing the end users to have self-service modeling. So they can now register those devices and, and get up and running quite quickly. Then we move over to um, the endpoint services. So here we're talking about making sure that you can deploy your security patches in a timely fashion but not only your security patches, but also your application patches. Endpoint security. So we've talked about the, um, the chip to cloud, and we've talked about the Pluton, and we've talked about the um, you know, hardening the, the hardware layer, but also talking about the Windows 11 and the endpoint security there is removing those endpoint agents. We've found that those endpoint agents do affect our battery, do affect our performance. So leveraging what's built into Windows 11 today you're now going to get integrated capabilities, particularly also when you talk about our EDR. So when you're talking about EDR, you're also talking about um, improving that security. The ultimate goal here is to improve the end user's experience, uh, but also provide you with that better security posture. The last one down the bottom there is virtualization. So you can acquire Windows 11 in three different forms from Microsoft. One is physicals. The other one is Windows 365, and I'm happy to talk to you about Windows 365 after the today's session, and also through Azure Virtual Desktop. So we've seen virtualization, and particularly around cloud compute, and the performances and the user's experience that they get from, um, from getting using those platforms. So if, this should not be new for everybody here. So uh, you know, I'll, we'll recap it on a bit, but I'd like to get a show of hands here. Who remembers service packs and hot fixes? Yeah, and a few smiles as well. So yes, in 2015, with the launch of Windows 10, 
1507, we streamlined life cycle management. So we introduced what we call biannual feature updates. Now, as you can see there, with the likes of Windows 10 Pro at home, we provided 18 months of supportability. But more importantly there for Windows 10, for enterprise customers that have typically large deployments, is we've now got you on a 30-month rotation, which allows you to make sure that your end users' environments are stable. Good, good news is we've seen organizations through good management of lifecycle management. With Windows 11, we thought we'd enhance that. So we've now got annual monthly up, uh, annual um, feature updates, which again further extends that's the supportability. And most obviously more importantly from an enterprise perspective from a Windows 11, you've now got 36 months, which allows you to have that larger window. Now down the very bottom there, and hopefully you're already on this journey today, is that Windows 10 is really coming close to its end of support. You've now got 16 to 18 months before you need to start considering um, that move. A quick show of hands, and I think um, we may have heard from this from the, um, the speakers before us. Who here has got a level of Windows 11 deployed today? Certainly got a couple, couple of hands, yeah. So what I want to highlight here is that um, Windows 11, um, we've actually, and you've heard NAB and you've heard that Microsoft um, talk, to this, talk to the same story, is we've had organizations deploy Windows 11 in a fairly short period of time. Now, I put it to you today, one of the, um, the biggest um, issues that is perceived in moving to Windows 11 is, this, from an end user perspective, the change in UI and the look and feel. These organizations that have recently moved to Windows 11, that happens to be their lowest support call. So it's probably not the biggest issue. Yes, we've probably got potentially tens of thousands or thousands of um, employees that we've, we don't want to have um, ruffled, but it's certainly one of the lowest support calls. So let's think about uh, how do we get Windows 11. So Windows 11 is based on the same, same foundations as Windows 10. So that means you can still use your same deployment capabilities, your same scenarios, and the tools to deploy Windows 10. So think about that. So you can use what you use today to deploy the Windows 11 without making any further changes. So you can still use your update rings that you do today for, for your update processes. And one thing I've heard also from other customers, and we're fortunate to have some of the OEM and vendors of uh, hardware suppliers here today, is unfortunately we hear, and it was good to hear, Ron, that you're saying that you, know, you, you use the new device as the catalyst to move to Windows 11. You know, we hear constantly that you know, organizations are asking their, our OEM providers to downgrade these modern new devices to a Windows 10 version, which is potentially going to have security holes and low performance issues on the new hardware. So you're really effectively, you're going backwards. So all I can say is use that opportunity to go modern. Who's here not familiar with autopilot? You've heard it once or twice already mentioned today. Okay, I think it, so it sounds like everyone is familiar with autopilot. So it's again about zero trust. So where you've got your hardware supplies providing you with the devices. Your hardware ID is registered in the autopilot service, which is attached to Intune. And through, auto, or through um, modern provisioning, you can now deploy a device to a user using their corporate credential, get access to corporate apps securely. That whole process allows you to deliver a device um, without it being com compromised in the first instance. So let's take a few minutes and we'll take a walk through these four pillars. Now, the first one is hardware eligibility. Now, you've heard about new modern devices. Now, I don't imagine um, many of us would have more than a five-year-old device in our fleet today. So most of the devices should be Windows 11 compatible. But before you, before you need to understand that, we do provide you, through the tooling, the capability to identify what those devices are. And the good news is all your management tools today that you use for Windows 10 will also work for Windows 11. So I'll strongly suggest to go and talk to your project teams, um, look at, make sure that you're on your current serviceable branch. Also talk to your third party providers, make sure the, the apps that you've got today will work for Windows 11. 
but also rely on your experiences. So who's here deployed over the last three years, Windows 10 20H2? What about 21H2? Yep, and 22H2? Yeah, so you think about those processes, that, that, that effort that you've gone to deploy those particular upgrades, same with Windows 11. So use the same tool sets. Now, also to consider, as, um, as my speakers always mentioned too, the security has also improved, so make sure you take those in consideration. And particularly, if you also have to meet things like Essential 8. Also, and it was interesting to hear also, Ron, that you said that the, um, your teams, you had to make sure your operational teams are prepared. So make sure your policies, your procedures are up to date and also train. You know, it's, it's key to make sure that you've got those end users trained. Application readiness. Um, it's not as scary as I'm hoping you've heard already this morning. It's not as scary as you, can't, you think it is. But you've still got to do your homework. You've still got to identify those apps that you need to update, those that you need to replace, and also those that, um, that don't work. So look at, when I say don't work, so look at grading those. What's critical, what's important, and what's not. Do you need to bring those to the new modern device? And the good news is, if you haven't already heard, we also have AppAssure. So AppAssure is a process, uh, a service, that's available to you to help with that transition. Okay, so let's be real. You still will require coexistence. I can, I can guarantee you, you're going to have, and as you've heard before, you'll still have Windows 10 and Windows 11 in your environment today. So leverage your update rings. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't need to. So don't need to make a great big project out of this. And also don't overlook user readiness. Yes, there'll be a change in look and feel, but users, as we've heard, the adoption, you know, they're actually knocking on their next door neighbor saying, oh, how do you go? I want that too. So don't underestimate that. And also make sure you have a good communi communication tool. Make sure you target the right people at the right time for those, for those devices. So let's look at the first, first pillar, hardware readiness. If you're using Intune today, actually who's actually seen this report, cap this capability? Yep, so there's a couple, yeah, that's great, that's good to see. So what our endpoint teams have done is they've actually built the capabilities and reports into Intune so you can actually get this capability to understand what devices you have today um, that are capable of going to Windows 11. So change management databases, asset management databases have all over time lost their value. They've probably become bloated or stale. So using the likes of Intune, you can now not only identify what devices you have in your environment, but what's capable, what's not capable, or what's not even applicable. So when, I'm not sure you can see that screen too clearly, but when it looks at those that have either been upgraded or not that upgraded, you can also understand why they, they haven't been upgraded. And that might be coming back to not understanding what the hardware requirements are. We provide that, that analytics to you. Is it missing the right CPU level? Is it not got TPM 2.0? Is it UFI not enabled or configured correctly? So, most of us, I guess, are familiar with Intune. If you're not using Intune today, don't worry. There's still a PowerShell script you can run in Config Manager to go and still understand that hardware readiness. So you're not left alone. Let's look at the second pillar now. We built Windows 11 on the same management tools that you use today. So whether you're using Intune or Config Manager, you're probably using Config Manager to deploy your line of business apps and third-party apps. You're probably also using Intune to go and deploy your annual updates as well as your Patch Tuesday updates. Now, if you've also got code management in place, you've probably also got the likes of the Gateway, Config, Config, Conf, uh, Config Manager Gateway in place. Now, that's all about moving the management traffic off your VPN services. So with, um, so yeah, so with the update and business deployment services um, as one of the requirements that you got for Windows Update is you can schedule updates and you can approve updates. Now, if you're not approving an update like Windows 11 feature update, it's not going to get deployed. If you're not going to schedule a feature update for Windows 11, it's not going to be deployed. So you can control 
when Windows 11 gets delivered. And it's as simple as an update policy. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's through Intune or Config Manager or using your existing update rings, you can still control those updates. And obviously, Zero Trust is also at mind here. So um, with one of the services we'll talk about a little bit later is AutoPatch. So with Microsoft, we've also got machine learning capabilities. We'll understand what your devices are, what they're doing, but not only yours, but also the other customers around the globe. Now, I did mention apps. And as we've heard today, that hasn't been one of the biggest issues in deploying Windows 11. So it's not as scary as you think. So who here hasn't heard of the AppAssure service prior to today? Great, everyone's heard of it, that's awesome. So these are big numbers, granted. Um, but what I want you to take away here is through this AppAssure program, we have your back, so we can help you with that transition to Windows 11. So AppAssure service has been around since 2018. Um, it's available to all customers that are on at least 150 licenses of E3 in plus. So if you've got it today, leverage it. So these numbers here, you can actually can see here, you know, we're hitting 99.6% application capability, application compatibility um, stats across the 800,000 plus um, applications. Now, I guess one thing that's um, probably ought to note around that 90 million is through the AppAssure program is we had actually identified 3,000 broken apps that stopped an organizations globally from either window, moving to Windows 10 or Windows 11. So the AppAssure program was able to identify applications that are either incorrectly packaged, compiled, that are incorrect DLLs, registry keys were, weren't done properly, or they were using services that they probably shouldn't have been using. So through the AppAssure program, um, you can identify any of your line of business apps that you're worried about and move those to Windows 11. Now, if you haven't also used it, and you do have the resources available to you, we also have the test-based service. So there's a link there, I believe, um, later on how to use that test-based service. Now, I'll be interested to, so you know, moving to this last pillar here, this is about minimizing disruptions now. Um, I think everyone's, over the last two years, has heard this story um, you know, of the pandemic. And the great thing from a Windows 11 perspective, um, consistency remains from Windows 10 to 11. So who, who can recall a couple of, minutes, couple of minutes ago when Windows 10 was released? And, and if you can, the month. Okay, silence. So 2015, July 15, build 1507. So we introduced the modern framework Around the, around the updates. So we introduced the plan, we're gonna read this over here, that plan, prepare, and deploy. Now you remember me talking to you a little bit earlier around what would be two outcomes that we'd probably want our um, end users and business to have, that's productivity and secure. Well, there's two more. We want the end user experiences to be consistent, but also for them to remain collaborative. So let's revisit one of the first slides we talked about for Windows 11. You, know, you may recall in the context of zero trust and zero provisioning. So I know I've asked who's familiar with autopilot, who's actually using it? Great, so autopilot, if I use my own experience, I joined Microsoft right um, when Brisbane was going into its first major lockdown. I was fortunate to have my manager, my hiring manager at the time come and join me up here in Brisbane and he brought with him a brand new Surface device bo all boxed up. What I was interested in, and it really didn't dawn on me at the time, but it was still wrapped up in a cell phone. It never been opened. So I've opened it up, powered it on, and the first thing it asked me was to connect to a network. So I was able to connect to our guest Wi-Fi network. Now, I didn't have a login, but IT had provided me with a temporary password. So with my network login now, I was able to log in. It asked me to change my password, but more importantly, it asked me to register for Windows Hello for Business and multi-factor authentication. So I used a QR code to download the app and register using the self-service portal, my new password. The autopilot provision kicked in. 
It came up with the next screen. It said, okay, what is your regional settings and what keyboards you want to use? And that was it. It says, okay, we're now provisioning your desktop. I went off and had a coffee 20, 25 minutes later, came back, and I was now left at my logon screen. Use my Windows Hello for Business Register for my biometrics, and I was in. I now had a brand new device, which IT had never seen. It was registered in autopilot, so it already had my apps, my security, and my configuration deployed while I was waiting. And now that I'm logged in, I now have access to all my corporate data. So what does that mean for you as a business? So you can now get devices that are ready in just a few simple steps. You can reduce your involvement from your IT departments, and your employees can now be running up in minutes. And most importantly, your information remains protected. Now, I've also heard as an antidote, another customer say that the autopilot has helped them from the service desk perspective. Where the old provisioning processes that we're using is they would have an end user ring up saying, I don't know what the password is. So they had to either expose the user's password or there was a problem with deploying the application because the user didn't have the right context. So they had to either give a local admin account password, so therefore they were exposing local account details. So what they saw through this autopilot process is that a call on service desk to um, not allow that, um, those passwords to be ex exchanged. Now you've heard me talk about you know, the tools that you can use today, um, particularly around managing Windows 10 alongside Windows 10. So how do you wish to keep those, that new, modern, shiny desktop up to date and secure? Recently we relaunched the, um, the auto patch service. So can I ask a quick question? Who in here knows, well, that's a loaded question, who here knows of an admin that enjoys Patch Tuesday, or patching in general? Yeah, no, there's a couple of smiles and nod and nod of heads. No, no so not, there's not a lot. So you think about their process that they go through. They've got to download, they've got to install, they've got to test, maybe even test a couple of times, and they'll go and socialize. This is the new features and functions to the different teams. Maybe they'll go and run a pilot, maybe even have to test once more before they can validate and, and roll it out. So it's not a very simple process. And why should you? You know, Microsoft, we have your back. So let's look at the um, auto patch service. If you're an E3 customer, you currently have this and you're entitled to it today. So the auto patch service is a cloud-based service. Um, and given today's climate you know, around security, your patching is critical. We've got customers out there that are running multiple versions of Windows 10 and 11. They're worried about patching. So what they've actually done is they've actually widened their security posture. They've now got a larger footprint that's potentially vulnerable. But not only that, is that um, the, the end user experience is gonna be different across all the different um, end users. So update paralysis is a real thing. Sorry, my, my scroll's going back up and forth. I'm just losing track where I'm up to. Um, so yeah, it's a real thing. So um, there are also the flip side. You've also got organizations that are really good at it. You know, they are patching regularly. So you've just heard the effort that it goes for one user to go and patch a system or test it before it can be deployed. So there's a lot of resources going into that. So from a, a large organization that is doing it regularly, have it down pat, they could potentially be using these resources for other things, other better, better projects. And mostly, but probably, may also be outsourcing it. So from an autopilot perspective, you have the option to register your devices. You don't have to opt in all devices. You can take your, your pick and, and put those that you wish to go into the service. So we will do all that validation for you. So is it a managed service? So you think about Microsoft now. We're actually sitting at the back end. We've actually deployed the operating system. We know what it looks like, we know what the patches look like, but because we're now monitoring not only your organization, but other organizations globally, we'll see the impact of a patch way before you will. We'll be able to identify and mitigate some of those changes way before you will. So auto patch is probably a service it's worth looking at. So in closing, so how do you become successful? So I did mention, you know, the go-do's, those four pillars, 
establishing and understanding your hardware requirements, but also leveraging the analytics you know, that Intune and, and Config Manager provide you. Go and identify those hardware readinesses. Find out from that hardware readiness, you know, have I got a fleet of devices that I need to go and buy and replace to those that I have got on, on premise today that I need to go and upgrade. Also leverage to plan to coexist and run Windows 7 in parallel with Windows 11. And as Fraser's also showcased, there is a lot of enhancements in the security too, so don't take that for granted. And obviously, engage in our fast track and our AppAssure program. So I'm going to say thank you for listening, and also I trust that your deployment will be successful and seamless. So for those that are interested, um, I've also got a link there. So if you want to do that uh, communication to your end users, there's a communication tool available that includes PowerPoint, PDFs, and also emails for you to use. So thanks again, and I'll hand you back over to our MC, um, Cara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you, Fraser. Um, some great information shared with us all there today, and I'm pretty confident if Windows 11 isn't on the roadmap yet, it will be very soon, right? Um, so we're just gonna close out now to our virtual audience. Thank you for attending today. Uh, but before we do that, we'd like to showcase our latest and greatest uh, announcement in market outside of Windows 11, obviously, Microsoft 365 Copilot.